think we justify our behaviors in order to be at peace with our perversions and demons. We demand that society accepts our addictions, that the world shifts for us, rather than accepting that something within us should change. My name is Gabe Woolley, and I struggle with same-sex attraction. At the time, I didn't really notice a pinpoint moment when it started, but I think that looking back now, as an adult and reflecting on my past, I can then see trauma points where it started and or where it was fostered through time. But I was, you know, raised in a Christian home. We went to church and my parents really did model a good relationship with Jesus for us. It wasn't just the religious aspect of go to church and read your Bible. Those were, you know, side effects of that. But I do think that maybe growing up in that lifestyle brings a extra sense of shame on a person to hide it, something that they're struggling with. Even if you are struggling with something that you didn't cause to go into motion. So I think there are things that happen to us that cause trauma and a lifestyle. And then there are things that happen because of a choice we made. And then I think there's the combination of both. It started with me because of something or things that maybe happened to me, but what fostered it through time were the decisions that I made. You know, giving into the addiction, giving into sexual lust, giving into a community that I felt like I could identify with and didn't have to hide. And that continued to foster it through time. So there is this pinpoint moment maybe where something happens to someone. And I think a lot of us can't locate it. Maybe it happens very young. For me, I went through some trauma even through birth that kind of set me on a trajectory to struggle with things and struggle with identity and struggle with the thoughts and feeling like maybe I don't belong in this world. And then I think things latch on to that and continue to foster an identity crisis throughout the rest of our lives. And I was, you know, bullied all through school, like fourth grade, all to senior year. And I think that's become more common now. I'm a teacher, so I definitely see that with students today. But, you know, I was very heavily bullied. I was sort of the target. I was on the swim team in high school and I was sort of the target person to mess with for the whole swim team. I had a nickname. They nicknamed me Bruno because at that time that movie about Bruno came out and it was about a gay man and they decided to use that and make my nickname and call me gay. And I think that that through school started to leak over outside of the swim team and come a a school-wide thing that I would run into and everyone would call me gay or ask if I'm gay or project that identity onto me, even though I had a girlfriend all through high school and was very interested in my relationship with her, you know, and was attracted to her and all that. I just think that this identity through the words people were speaking and through the culture and through the ideas were fostering something in me internally that maybe I didn't recognize at the time. But then there were this, the internal aspect of things that I genuinely struggled with my sexual addictions and my sexual struggles and my same sex attraction. So it was happening on the inside and the outside and cultivating this whole persona and this whole identity in every area of my life. And it was only a matter of time before it starts to manifest itself externally and can't be a secret for much longer. And just this idea, like at school, this idea of the social aspects of things. I remember living out of the property that we grew up on for 10 years. My dad built the house, my mom designed it, and we had a neighbor boy and he was struggling with some sexual exposure that he had brought been brought to at a young age. And he started to lash out sexually just in jokingly, just in different ways, even before I was to the age where I hit puberty, where that meant anything to me, right? The sexual behavior that I was seeing on TV or from people. But I think that put an impression on me, certainly. I would say that the commentary and some of the behaviors were sexually inappropriate and kind of fostered that idea of homosexuality in my mind at a young age before I could even recognize what that was. And it's it's interesting thinking about these different things that happened through my life and I talk about the idea of being exposed to things even before hitting puberty. It's like they're storing up files in my brain. Then when you do hit puberty, the body starts to align with your what your mind has already been exposed to. And that's where 
different forms of sexuality seem to come from. I think when I was really young, I don't know how old I was exactly. My parents were at a meeting one time and I was watching TV in a room so they could have their meeting at some office space and just like cable TV flipping through the channels. And there was an, a movie that came on a scene of a male stripper in a strip club dressed like an astronaut. And I don't know if I had even hit puberty at this time. I don't remember how old I was, but the image is like seared in my brain, right? And and I think maybe that was just another moment or example of the neural pathways being developed in my brain, you know, jumping onto that same-sex attraction boat that I had already been exposed to through forms of media, through my neighbor at the time, through the sexuality of society, just continue to latch on that and deepen it and solidify it and into my adulthood. I think that that moment where I had seen that film or that part of the film really opened the part of my brain where I realized the power of imagery, seeing you know that scene with that male stripper and it was seared into my brain and I don't know if it meant anything to me at the time, but as a child I was pulled really into it without even having any sexual urges at that time at that young age. But then what you see in your brain and the images you see, then when you do start to go through puberty and have that aspect of your life come into play, those images can start to align with your sexuality. And I don't remember exactly what age the porn addiction started from, probably middle school, but I do remember that it was very heavy. It caused a lot of secrecy and darkness and a lot of sneaking, and it was very much an addiction to the point where it was every day like daily, like the addiction was controlling me. I was not in control of the addiction. It's interesting observing aspects of addiction and porn like that too, because I've re even realized talking to my friends, there have been times in my life where I have been very heavily addicted every day. And then there's times where I don't care about it. Exactly. And then it comes back around, you know? There really is this idea, I think, that comes from, you know, sex culture, but especially with men and having friends who are men or teenagers, boys at the time, you know, there's this status that if you can lose your virginity or how many girls you can get with, that was certainly in my brain and a culture too. And I always had a girlfriend and I had an attractive girlfriend in high school and I liked the attention from that certainly, but internally I was still struggling though. I was attracted to her. I was still very much struggling with my own internal secrets of homosexuality. And then it was just really this porn addiction for a long time, just between myself and I, and I never acted on that physically with anybody else until girls were attracted to me. And I think I liked the attention that I had got from them. And I always had a girlfriend, but at a time I was single and I was working at a grocery store chain with a lot of other teenagers. And there was a girl that took an interest in me and I was not attracted to her, but I was attracted to the attention I got from her and our friend group and everything. And my mistake was I really let that go too far and played with her emotions, you know, as a young 18 year old, just liking the attention from it. And we, my friends and I, I had moved out and got my first apartment with my roommate and we would have friends over all the time and a lot of underage drinking and things like that. And this girl, we would spend a lot of time together and I liked the idea of always hanging out and being with someone and getting the attention from them. But she was certainly attracted to me. And I was very, I think, flirty for the reasons of just what it felt like, the pride it brought me internally. And so I made the mistake of playing with her emotions, but that got me into a situation where we were all drinking at our apartment and we had never done anything physical. Again, I wasn't attracted to this girl, but she had come on to me and attempted to have sex with me and I didn't want to have sex with her. And I told her, you know, we were both very intoxicated and there were two friends there too. And I told her I, I wanted her to get off me. I was screaming, crying, asking her to leave me alone. And she started crying, talking about how I don't think she's attractive and kind of making me feel bad for, and you know, not pursuing anything sexual with her because I was not sexually attracted to her. And I told her, no, I told her I didn't want to do this 
friend of mine had heard that and said that reiterated that he said, no, you know, leave him alone. But everyone was so intoxicated at the time that it was really to the point you could barely control. Like I was laying on the floor pretty much in a state of paralysis almost from, and she was laying on top of me and she was bigger than me. And I, I couldn't overpower it. And my words weren't enough to stop her. And I eventually just decided to stop fighting it. And that's how I lost my virginity, even though I didn't want to. And so I think it's interesting talking about this idea when you talk about sexual abuse or pressuring someone. When you talk about the idea of a woman taking advantage of a man, like that's a controversial argument because how does that work? And, you know, I was just in the situation where I guess saying no, saying I didn't want to do this, I didn't want to have sex with this person wasn't good enough. And eventually I just gave in to it and let it happen. And that's how I lost my virginity. It wasn't who I wanted it to be with. It wasn't how I wanted it to be. But that I think was another moment that really solidified my sexual trauma. And at that point, I had realized that I had something that was mine, you know, my virginity that I could choose to give away or not was taken from me in a sense. So then I, I stopped caring after that point, you know, I don't have it anymore. I can't control it anymore. So I think that opened up a door of hookup culture and even going deeper into the homosexual aspect and the aspect of addiction started working for an organization in Tulsa and it was a nonprofit, more liberal organization, very much embraces the idea of diversity and equity and LGBTQ and Black Lives Matter and all those things. So I was really in the middle of that culture too, even though that didn't align with my personal convictions or my political beliefs. Um, And so that really started to foster this idea in me of embracing more of giving into whatever feeling I had, regardless of truth giving into whatever I wanted at that time as my identity and that it was acceptable and okay. And so after that program, right before I moved to Oklahoma city to go to college, I somehow stumbled upon Craigslist and found ways to meet with strangers and hookup culture was embraced through that time before I was aware of any of the other LGBTQ apps So I had met up with a guy for the first time and had my first semi-sexual encounter, I guess, with another man. And that just segued into a whole spiral down addiction of hookup culture all through college. Or at that age and time when I moved away, you know. And I just think that it's interesting looking back because there's not one circumstance that was the defining moment. It was a collection of different happenings through a period of time that fostered it. And I had really struggled with this, you know, because I still had my faith in God, but I still had my addiction and both were screaming at me and pulling at me, it seems like. And some days one was stronger than the other. But I moved back from college to, from Oklahoma City to Tulsa to finish college, really. And then I had connected with someone on an app And we became friends and we became partners, I guess you would say, sexual partners. And and I remember after I had moved back to Tulsa, waking up in a hotel room in the middle of the night, sleeping, being woken up, you know, next to this person. And I instantly had a panic attack. I had never had one before. I didn't really know what one was. But I was just, you know, dreaming and woke up out of my sleep and my brain just went to the idea that I'm going to hell, that I'm going to die. It was all consuming thought. I couldn't think of anything. I was pacing around the room, freaking out, you know, breathing heavy, called my pastor and I just couldn't control myself. Like it just completely consumed me just out of nowhere. And I think really I had just been participating with this darkness for so long that this idea of my faith that I was still trying to hold on to and still embrace this secret homosexual lifestyle collided with each other and spun me into a panic attack and spun me into this moment of fear and darkness and thinking my life was just completely over. And 
that was it. I, I mean, I thought I was going to die in that moment. I don't know how to explain it. I'm not someone that normally has panic attacks. That was my first experience with it. And I haven't really had many since. So it was just a really traumatic moment right there in the middle of my situation where I was having this huge secret from my family, from my friends, from everyone and embracing it on a daily basis in the darkness. And I think the secrecy I was keeping to myself and hiding this from everyone for so long just collapsed on me in that moment and triggered the panic attack. I don't know. I don't study panic attacks a lot. I don't know how it works. That was my first time experiencing one, but it was probably one of the more traumatic experiences of my life, certainly. And I can still visually see it to this day. It's seared in my brain. I think with hookup culture, sex culture, homosexual culture, some things that I learned interacting with other people and my own experiences there is a lot of anxiety around STDs, you know, HIV, all these risks that you're taking. That certainly played a huge role in my mind all the time. But it was like there was a sexual addiction at the same time and a lot of acting out sexually and hookup culture. And it's crazy to think that it can become so heavy and so addictive for people that they're willing to risk all of that, knowing how much the study there's on it. Some of it is irreversible if you get to a certain point and catch a certain thing. It's a very, very powerful addiction and struggle, as I think almost any addiction can be when it gets to that point. But somehow, I mean, I was fortunate not to ever come to that point where I caught like HIV or something that would be irreversible. And I think like with perversion and addiction, there's this scale, you know, Addiction and perversion always want more. There's never a limit to it, right? So I I stumbled across porn and had traumatic experiences that latched onto me. And I was addicted to porn. And I said, but I would never do anything with another man. And then I came to that point where I did. And I said, but I would never date a man. I would never let it go that far. Like I could control it at that point while still giving into it on a daily basis. And then it did come to the point where I found myself in a relationship with another man in secret. And again, it was very much the attention I got from this person because it was a semi-abusive relationship in a lot of ways, actually. And I was living in Tulsa at this time. You know, I had already been acting out sexually and embracing the idea of hookup culture or other men for a couple of years at this point. But then now I find myself actually coming across this person, pressuring me to be in a relationship with them and being in a very vulnerable point in my life because my family had experienced a different unrelated trauma with the issue with DHS and Clayton and my family and rescue Clayton and all that stuff. And that just really left me in a place where the dopamine and the opportunities of escaping this chaos in my life weren't going to cut it anymore. I, I needed a higher dosage and a higher level. And I think this relationship offered that. So I ignored all the red flags, not even a person I would normally find myself with, not holding any qualities in a person that I would want to marry or be with someone, let alone not wanting to marry a man. I never could see myself doing that. I have always wanted to marry a woman and have a family. And that's always been a natural desire of mine as well. But then I still found myself now dating a man, something I said I would never do. And I just think that continued trauma and vulnerability, that was the next opportunity I had to take to escape the chaos of my own life, you know, and live a secret life where I could get away with stuff or do things that I wanted to do that just maybe were semi-normal from everything that was going on with my family and my own struggles and everything. Everything had become very public with my family's story at that point. And this relationship was the first time I had sort of come out, not to everybody, but come out and would go in public places, out to bars and gay bars and clubs and things like that. And within that community, the LGBTQ community, I would be more open and out in that sense. I've never really come out to everybody on every platform in every way, regardless of where I am until now, right here. I really thought and struggled with, I'll never be able to tell my family this. I'll never be in a marriage with a woman because I'll always struggle with this. I'll never have this life that I've always wanted because of the things that I'm struggling with. But I came to a point where 
I feel like God ended up exposing me because I wasn't willing to do it myself to my family. And they, they embraced the reality of my struggle and they had grace with me and they didn't accept it as my identity, but they took it as like a call to action. And I think my family was really there to support me as well as my best friend. And, but I did have other friends through it too that wanted me to embrace the homosexual lifestyle and being like, that's okay. You know, like just do what you want to do and be who you want to be. And I couldn't seem to explain to them that this is something maybe I want on a daily basis when it comes to the addiction or when it comes to now being addicted to this relationship I was in with this other man. But it's not what I really want. Ultimately, it's not what drives me to keep going. What drives me to keep going is always having, since I was a young child, knowing I wanted to be a father and have a family and a wife and seeing that modeled by my parents. But I had some friends that couldn't understand that. And I lost a lot of friends, I think because of that and me going back to my more conservative roots and my faith. I never really accepted the homosexuality as my true identity. It was something I always struggled with. And I, I took it to certain levels and it temporarily accepted part of it. But I I think in the back of my mind and in my heart, I always knew this was temporary. And I still struggle today with the thoughts, with the addictions, with stumbling and falling and giving in sometimes. But I know what I've wanted in my life, what I've asked God for, what I've held in my heart. And it's not this. And so I think I'm just on this journey of this battle of overcoming it, which I think is a journey people go through almost their whole life, the whole time they're here on earth. I don't know that it will ever completely go away. I think it'll be a choice every day to choose between giving into it again or not and embracing the family that I want to have. But it doesn't just go away. Yeah, I guess the, what I would say to that, I think this idea of like, you know, working out our salvation is going through these daily struggles and this push and pull and figuring out what does it really mean to accept grace in every area of our life and every moment daily and minute by minute in our life. And I think I'm challenged with that a lot. You know, there's not this miracle moment where this light shines from heaven and the addiction's just gone. That certainly can happen, but I don't think that that's very common for the average person. And I think it is like a muscle that we have to strengthen, you know, our, our discipline. Having a community that rallies around you and fosters you towards truth. And I, I think it's important to know that there's a difference between someone who struggles with an addiction or homosexuality, or whatever it is, and hates that part of the, about themselves and is fighting it. And is not accepting it as their true identity. And then there's the other person that has embraced it and accepted it as truth. And I think those are two very different things. Even if both of them are stumbling into it and struggling. And like I'm coming public now with my struggles. And if I stumble again into something. I have more empathy for people who are rejecting it as their identity and wrestling with it even if they stumble and fall into it again, because I know that they're in a war, in a battle with it. So you can expect to be knocked down, but getting back up certainly is the biggest aspect to that. But then there's the other side where culture tells us to embrace it, and this is normal, this is acceptable, and just be yourself, live your truth, and has accepted that. And I have just not been able to ever accept that about myself, no matter how far I've come. You know, I went down that scale of saying I would never look at porn and then I'm addicted to porn, but I would never do anything physically with another man or another person. And then I did. And then I would never be in a relationship with another man. And then I did like as if I could control it somehow and still embrace it at the same time. And I just, I think my heart is very open now to people who struggle with addictions of any kind, but really sexual immorality or whatever you want to call it. The person who's not accepting it as their identity, but still wrestling with it. I think there's a lot to be said 
for those people that are in that battle and continue to fight and not give up on that. And I think of what we're seeing a lot in society now is embracing this idea of your own truth as if there's not some actual higher ultimate truth. Whatever you're feeling can be your truth and you can embrace that as your identity and your truth. And I reject that notion. I understand why people fall into it. Society has really taught us that you can have the best of both worlds. We see a lot of churches now, LGBTQ churches, you can have your Christian faith and your homosexuality. And again, comes back to that idea of, yeah, I understand Christians who struggle with homosexuality, but now we're seeing society say, no, both are actually desirable and moral and okay and somehow aspirational to be cohesive together. I don't agree with that. I can empathize with people who struggle with it, but I don't think I can ever get on board with the idea that you could somehow have both and sit well with yourself and not have yourself be torn apart. If you are truly trying to embrace both. One of them, you just, you, what's the word? Compromised, I guess. Truly, one of them you ended up compromising with and are still just wearing the label of it, but not actually having it wholeheartedly. It's either your faith or it's whatever addiction or sin or other identity you've given into. One of them is your identity. The other one is just a brand you're wearing. I don't think you can have both truly at the same time. We justify our behaviors in order to be at peace with our perversions and demons. We demand that society accepts our addictions and that the world should shift for us rather than accepting that something within us has to change. Without that sense of community and that social aspect of things, I very well could have given into it and been a completely different person today with a completely different identity and totally rejected my conservative beliefs and ended up rejecting my Christian faith or trying to compromise it. And without these people in my life and being able to tell my story, even here today, the picture would look very different. (laughs) 